Thanks again. So now I'm going to look at a completely different problem, which is how do we compute distance in a fairly general setting? And so the problem here is I have a domain like this bunny, and I have maybe a distinguished point like this blue dot on his cheek. And what I want is to find the shortest distance to every other point. Okay, and just to be clear here, what I want is not the straight line Euclidean distance, which would be very easy to compute, but actually the length of the shortest path along the surface, in other words, the geodesic distance. Now, typically the way you approach this problem, whether you're using uh, Dijkstra's algorithm or fast marching or an exact polyhedral scheme, is you start at the source point and you march outward. But there are a couple challenges with this approach. One is if I want to compute the distance to a different point, then I have to start all over again from scratch. And I can't take advantage of any of this computation that I did the first time around. The other issue, um, especially on unstructured meshes, is that this serial marching process is very difficult to parallelize. The distance that I compute at one iteration depends directly on the distance I computed in the previous iteration. So even if I have some massively parallel machine, I'm stuck running on just a single processor. And another issue is that depending on what kind of data I'm working with, I may not be able to use my favorite algorithm. So for instance, there are some very nice exact polyhedral schemes for triangle meshes. But if I'm working with something like a point cloud or a polygon mesh or a regular grid or a volume mesh like a tet mesh, it's not clear how to apply these schemes. Okay? So to address all of these challenges, um, we introduced the heat method. And sort of the key thing about the heat method is that it's based on solving just two standard linear equations, the heat equation and a Poisson equation. And since these two equations are so extremely well studied in scientific computing, we can immediately take advantage of all sorts of tools for solving them. Um, for instance, we can easily parallelize, just plug into a parallel linear solver. We can prefactor if we want to compute the solution for many different problems on the same domain. We can use any spatial discretization we like, if we know how to discretize a Laplacian, for instance. And it's very easy to implement. We just build the same old matrices and plug them into the same old linear solvers. From a more mathematical point of view, what we've done is taken a very difficult nonlinear hyperbolic problem, like a propagating wavefront, and transformed it via change of variables into simpler linear elliptic problems, something like interpolating boundary data. Okay, so let's see how this all works. So typically, the way that you formulate distance computation is in terms of this iconal equation. So if phi is the distance to the source, the iconal equation says that the gradient of phi has to have unit norm everywhere. Or put more simply, it sort of says that distance changes at one meter per meter. So for instance, if I want the distance to this curve, I could set phi to zero along the curve and solve the iconal equation everywhere else. The problem with this formulation is that it's pretty nonlinear. In the discrete setting, it's a big system of quadratic equations, which is very difficult to solve. You have to develop some specialized solver for that, like fast marching. But there's another really nice characterization of distance, this time in terms of the heat kernel, which I'll write as k sub t. And a good way to think about the heat kernel is that I take a scorching hot needle and I touch it to a point on a surface and I watch how heat diffuses out over a time t. And what Veridon showed is that if I apply a simple closed form transformation to this heat kernel, then as t approaches zero, I recover the exact geodesic distance. And so at this point, some of you may be thinking, aha, I know what he's going to do. He's just going to compute the heat kernel and plug it into this Veridon's formula to get the distance. Well, the issue is that um, if your approximation of the heat kernel doesn't decay at just the right rate, then when you plug it into this carefully crafted Veridon formula, you're not going to get something that looks much like distance. And so this is really the basic observation behind the heat method, is that we can just take any radially symmetric function that decays monotonically with distance and take its gradient, and we'll get a gradient field that at least points in the right direction, even if it has the wrong magnitude. Of course, we know from the iconal equation exactly what the magnitude should be. It should be 1 everywhere. And so we can just normalize this gradient field to get the gradient of distance. From there, if we want to recover the distance function itself, suppose I call this normalized gradient field x, then we're going to look for the function phi, whose gradient is as close as possible to x. Or equivalently, we're just going to solve a standard Poisson equation with the divergence of x on the right-hand side. 
Overall, then, the heat method consists of just three simple steps. First, we solve or approximate the heat equation. Second, we normalize the gradient. And third, we recover the distance itself by solving a Poisson equation. And this picture really illustrates the beautiful thing about the heat method, which is that we've taken this nonlinear problem and we've split it up into two linear pieces by just inter introducing the right change of variables in between. And the other thing that you notice about this formulation is it doesn't depend at all on our choice of spatial discretization. I didn't say anything about triangle meshes or point clouds or grids. So as long as you know how to evaluate an, a Laplacian, a gradient, and a divergence, then you can apply this method. Okay? But let's see how this actually works out in the discrete setting. So the first thing we need to do is approximate the solution to this heat equation. So we, if we replace the time derivative on the left by a finite difference, and we evaluate the Laplacian at the new time t, then we get a backward Euler step, which we can write as a linear elliptic equation. So basically something that behaves very much like a positive definite linear system. If we compute the solution for just a single source point, we get a function that looks like this sort of circus tent. And it doesn't really look much like the heat kernel, but it does decay monotonically with distance. Likewise, if we want the distance to a curve, then we can distribute heat along this curve, and we get a solution that looks like this. This function also has a uh, well-established relationship with distance. Um, again, if I apply a simple closed form transformation of this function, then as t goes to zero, I'm going to recover the exact geodesic distance. And so then the question is, well, what value of t should I use in practice when I take this backward Euler step? You might think that you should take the smallest t possible, so some tiny floating point number, but actually if you do a little bit of analysis uh, in the discrete case on a regular grid, what you find is that as t goes to zero, you approach not the geodesic distance, which you see on the far left, but actually the combinatorial distance, which you see on the far right. And so then you wonder, okay, how big do I need to make t to make sure that I get the optimal uh, a solution that's as accurate as possible? Um, by simple scaling arguments, you know that t should have the form mh squared, where m is a constant and h is the average spacing between nodes, so maybe the average uh, edge length in your mesh. And by doing some more analysis on this regular grid and also looking empirically at a bunch of examples, what you find is that by setting this constant to 1, you very often get something very close to optimal. So throughout all the examples I'll show and discuss in this talk, I'm just going to set t to h squared, where again h is the average edge length. In terms of spatial discretization, again, you can use whatever you want. For instance, on triangle meshes, you can use the well-known Cotan formula. On polygon meshes, we use a recent uh, polygonal Laplacian introduced by Mark Alexa and Max Fordetsky. There's a lot of nice work being done right now on Laplacians for point clouds, and we used uh, one by Lou et al., uh, on tet meshes, you can use something like discrete exterior calculus, and on regular grids, you can use whatever finite differences you like. Um, a really important question when choosing a spatial discretization is how accurate is the solution relative to the exact geodesic distance? Um, but before going further with this question, I think it's really important to understand what does the exact geodesic distance actually mean? For instance, if I have this circle and I approximate it by this orange square with unit edge lengths, then the distance between these two points on the square is 2, but the distance along the circular arc is 2.22. And so if I have a method that gets me closer and closer and closer to the number 2, am I really getting a more accurate solution, or am I just getting a more precise number for this rough approximation? I think the answer really depends on what kind of application you're interested in. If you're doing something like computational geometry, where you imagine the mesh really is an exact description of the surface, then you probably want this number too. But if you're doing something like solving a PDE, where you care about the smooth solution, then you probably want this number 2.22. And something interesting that we encountered when putting this paper together is that if you compute um, this exact polyhedral distance, even on a very, very nice mesh like this sphere, it's actually only a quadratic approximation of the true smooth distance, whereas fast marching and the heat method both give you something like uh, a linear approximation. And so this is something to keep in the back of your mind when thinking about the trade-offs uh, of these different algorithms in terms of simplicity and speed and accuracy. Another thing to keep in mind is, what's the cost of running one of these methods if I want to compute the distance to lots of different source points or lots of different subsets? 
A key thing about the heat method is because we're just solving these linear equations, we can pre-factor our matrices once and then apply back substitution many, many times to get very good amortized performance. So the overall cost of solving all of these problems is greatly reduced. So here's one example where we compare against uh, the fast marching method of uh, Kimmel and Setian. And what you notice is that the accuracy is quite comparable in all these examples, but if you look at the amortized performance, the heat method's about 20 times faster on average. And I should point out that that's 20 times faster without doing any kind of parallelization at all. So we're just running this on a single core. And so again, you could get even more speed up by plugging into just a standard parallel linear solver. Whereas if you want to parallelize fast marching, especially for something like an unstructured mesh, it becomes very challenging. Here's sort of a visual comparison of accuracy. So these are three different methods. I'm not telling you yet what they are. And here's the, the front of the kitten, and there's the back. And can you tell which method is which? So it's actually pretty hard, right? They're all, they all look pretty similar. And uh, on the left, we have fast marching. In the middle, we have the heat method. And on the right, you have this exact polyhedral scheme. And one thing you notice is that you really, in terms of the visual uh, appearance, you don't gain a whole lot by, by doing this second order accurate method. Right? It looks very much like this fast marching thing on the left. The one thing you might notice here is that the heat method slightly smooths out these sharp cusps in the level lines. But in practice, we found that this isn't really a problem. For instance, if we want to extract something like the medial axis of this letter here, we can just compute the boundary, uh, the distance to the boundary, and threshold the second derivatives. And what we get looks very much like what we would get out of fast marching. Here's just a few more examples. Again, the distance to, a bound, to the boundary, and here you can see that we get a very nice sharp cut locus, meaning points where the shortest path to the boundary is not unique. Here's a nice example of robustness. So we have this mesh with all sorts of holes and long, thin sliver triangles and so forth, and you can see that we have no trouble computing a nice, smooth geodesic distance. Uh, here's a similar example, but now with a point cloud. So we have a lot of missing data. We have all sorts of noise. And again, we get a nice smooth distance function. And a really interesting thing about these point cloud Laplacians is that they're purely intrinsic. So if you imagine you have a low dimensional data set sitting in a high dimensional space, you're only going to pay the cost of that low dimensional data set. Whereas if you use something like fast marching, you have to build kind of a high dimensional scaffolding around your data. So this might be useful for something like machine learning. Um, here's an example on a, pol on a polygonal mesh, and we have not only quadrilaterals, but also uh, a lot of octagons. And in the eye, you see there's this crazy 32-sided non-convex polygon. And again, we can compute the distance directly on this mesh without doing some kind of arbitrary tessellation first. Here's a simple example on a regular grid. We compute the distance to the silhouette of a bunny. And here I'm just using second-order uh, differences. And here's an example of robustness to noise. So I just add uh, a huge amount of uh, random noise to this, this vase. And if I compute the distance on this noisy surface, but then visualize it back on the original surface on the far right, you can see that it looks actually not so bad. It looks not too far from the distance that we uh, expected. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it much here, but in the paper we go into a lot of detail about how you can find a slightly smoother distance by just increasing this time parameter t above the optimal value. And this be might be nice if you have an application where you don't want these sharp cusps in the level lines. Um, since putting our paper online, actually a lot of people have picked up the heat method and started using it for all sorts of uh, nice applications, for instance, um, mesh editing and flow visualization and so forth. So this seems to be something that really is um, pretty easy to implement and pretty uh, useful in practice. Okay, so overall what we did here is we took a very old problem, distance computation, and we really looked at it in a, in a new light. So we took this traditionally nonlinear hyperbolic problem and by a change of variables reformulated it as just linear elliptic problems. The practical payoff is we get an algorithm that's very simple. We just have to solve the same old linear equations. It's very fast because we can plug these equations into existing uh, linear solvers that people have spent you know, hundreds of hours optimizing. And we can use any existing discretization. We can work with all kinds of different data because people have worked hard to come up with differential operators on all these different types of data sets. And maybe the best indicator that it's a useful algorithm is, well, it seems that people have already started using it. Um, there's still a couple things we'd like to do in the future. Uh, 
for one thing, we have some tricks up our sleeve that may help us improve the accuracy uh, of the solution. And another thing is to look at anisotropic distance calculations. So just recently at SGP, I saw a paper by uh, Campen and colleagues where they made a naive modification to the heat method, just basically changing the edge lengths, and showed that that doesn't actually give you very nice results for anisotropic distance. So now we're working on, you know, how do you really solve this problem in a principled way, but still take advantage of these nice features like prefactorization. And that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for your attention. Questions, please. Nice talk. Um, quick question. In the Iconal equation, when you have flow lines coming together, you don't actually have unit norm gradient, right? Because they right. sort of cancel. And similarly, well, sort of a related problem is when you have a thin handle, if your heat kernel size is too large, the flow lines will sort of wrap around. Uh, and so how does this affect the quality of your solution, particularly on thin regions where flow lines meet? Does, you said there were some issues with smoothness. Is this a general problem due to the cancellation or? Yeah. So for thin, thin regions, I haven't experienced any particular problems. Um, I guess, again, you know, in the limit things, uh, you'll recover the exact geodesic distance. And um, in terms of these, these sharp features of this fact that at, at these, uh, these cusps, you don't actually have a you know, well-defined derivative. Um, actually, this is a great question. I mean, for me, this is kind of a mystery why solving this sort of smooth elliptic uh, Poisson equation it manages to resolve these sharp features so well. So I think that's, a, that's an excellent question and something I'd like to understand more. Would this method work well for computing sine distance fields? Uh, for computing sine distance fields? Yeah. That's a great question. I'd have to think about it more. <laughs> okay. But good thing to think about. All right, thank you. Other question? While they're coming up, uh, so um, can you say something about the nature of the matrices? You, you say fast linear solvers, but... Mm -hmm. Are we looking at large matrices, positive, definite? But yeah, well, see, this is literally in, in, these, in both of these problems, it's literally the Cotan Laplacian, so the one ring Laplacian, sparse, symmetric, positive, definite. Um, yeah, same okay. thing that you use for basically any geometry processing problem or any physical simulation problem. Uh, Krylov methods or? You can use, yeah, you, you can use ones? Krylov methods, you can use factorization, you can use, I mean, th that's kind of the point, is that we're not doing anything differently numerically than any other problem you, you want to solve. So if you have okay. tricks for solving those problems, you can apply them to this problem. That's, Thank you. That's the really neat thing. Thanks, Keenan. Thanks.